and welcome back, boys and girls, for another special edition of the Michael Deacon Program. Joining me in a moment is Mr. Lon Strickler, a Freudian researcher and author. He is the publisher of the popular Phantoms and Monsters blog. Lon's research and reports have been featured on major online platforms and television shows like Ancient Aliens, Paranormal Witness, and Monsters and Mysteries in America. You can hear him over on YouTube, by the way, at Phantoms and Monsters Radio. Now, without further ado, let's bring him right on in. And joining me right now live, well, not so live, pre-recorded, but live and direct in our hearts and minds. I'm joined by none other than Lon Strickler. How are you, my friend? I'm doing fine. Very nice. I'm glad you're here. I've been wanting to talk to you for quite some time now. And, you know, we were trying to iron this out back in uh, sometime in October, but that's a very, very busy month for you, I'm, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, yeah, the year's pretty pretty tight. Oh, I can imagine, especially during that time. And um, do, do you love October as much as I do, Lon? I am a fall person. Yes, I am. Uh, I knew it. October just feels right. I'm not sure why. Yeah. There's something about October that just feels uh, kind of magical to a weird degree. Yeah, I've always uh, always liked getting out of the heat and and going into a change before winter. And uh, yeah, I, I've always enjoyed the fall. That's what it's all about, in my opinion. That, that mm-hmm. great weather sometimes, well, it depends where you're at, but... Um, you know, actually, I'm out here in California, and the weather's always uh, nice, and uh, as I, I have a co-host who comes on here. He's in Pennsylvania, and he's always talking about shoveling snow and all this uh, stuff, and I just think, my God, screw mm. all that, Lon. That, that's too much work. Yeah, the snow the snow is probably the worst part of all of it, but uh, I don't know, I'm retired now, so I don't have to worry, worry about it too much anymore. All right, yeah. yeah if you're retired and uh, enjoying that aspect then yeah i mean what's the point of uh, doing any of it shoveling Absolutely. snow yeah screw that <laughs> screw that noise my friend um but yes so much to talk about i'm glad you're here and not to be honest with you lon although the world is a mess right now 2024 has already been quite exciting for better or for worse well i i think 20 i think 2024 and yeah. i felt like it's a couple months going into it, it's going to be a change somehow good or bad i don't know but there's going to be a change and as far as the supernatural world uh i i, I think i think things are going to happen i think we're going to see some changes we're going to see some things that are different um i i just got that sense so i don't know we'll have we'll wait and see yes we will have to wait and see and of course lots of disasters but also, a lot of uh, UFO and humanoid sightings and all these stories. You know, we had that aliens in the backyard in Vegas uh, just last year. <laughs> the alleged aliens in the yeah. backyard, yes. And, of course, uh, more recently, the alleged Miami sightings in, in the mall. Um, I, I just wanted to qu- get your uh, quick opinions and rundowns and all that jazz. Obviously, I don't think um, anyone saw anything. But, I mean, it makes a fun know. talking point. You think you think uh, someone I, saw something? Yeah, I, I don't know. I have talked to several people who were in the area at the time. Uh, most of those don't really know what to think. I, I think that the huge police presence is kind of what freaked most people out. And uh, I, I don't know what was reported about with the, for the fighting and whatever was supposed to have gone on and that they kind of reacted to it. But uh, I do know one thing. We we are going to, and a couple of my colleagues now are going to most likely do a remote view session. Nice on that, either this weekend or next week. So um, we're planning on it. I so love we that. will see. Uh, we will see what happens. And is this going to be something that will be uh, broadcasted in real time or something more private of sorts? Yeah, it'll, it'll be private until we get uh, until ah. we go through everything. Um, and uh, then we'll have our notes all done and all every conclusions, and then I'll go ahead and present those either on the uh, blog or on the uh, and, and maybe on the show. So we'll see. Very nice, very very nice. And uh, of course, yeah, you're you're talking about your your website and, and the show. Uh, definitely plug mm-hmm. away uh, already. Tell us a little bit about the show that you do. I. I I've uh, always been into uh, your your YouTube channel and hearing mm-hmm. about all those stories. I, I love all of the stories you've read 
um, Mr. Strickler? Well, I, um, I I decided about a year ago that I would start backing off on interviewing and, and start talking more about uh, what I have had sent to me, some of the investigations I've been involved with of all these years, and also our team investigations or whatever comes up. And uh, it, it gets a better reaction, I think, as opposed to doing interviews. Interviewing is, is fun to a point, but it gets old after a while. And, uh, you know, getting quality guests is not the easiest thing to do anymore. So uh, I decided that I would do a, a weekly show with a rundown of, of some cases I've been involved with or cases that are sent to me or encounters and such and, and go from there. And, you know, it, it, it does have good following. So uh, I decided to stick with it. Absolutely. And, of course, the website cryptidhunters.org. Uh, that's been one of my favorite sites for quite some time now, Lon. Yeah, you know, that's the team site. That's yeah, the, team the site. Phantoms of Monsters 14 research team. Right. Uh, our cases go up on there. Uh, the blog is phantomsofmonsters.com. And uh, I've been doing that now since 2005. And, of course, on YouTube, it's uh, Phantoms of Monsters Radio. Just search it and it'll bring you there. Yeah, he'll be there right away. And, yes, I'm... Looking at the website right now, cryptidhunters.org, for those who want mm -hmm. to uh, check it out. And yeah, you have quite the extensive team. Yeah, it's a pretty good-sized team. Got a lot of, a lot of experience on there. Um, we're kind of eclectic investigators. We don't stick to one subject. Uh, you know, we like to get a variety of things. But we've got people who are just, we have some people who are just involved with certain aspects of the paranormal or cryptids. And um you know, we uh, we go from there. So if something gets called in or, or I'm contacted about a case and I can get somebody with boots on the ground or to meet in person, the witnesses, then we will we will do that. Uh, and most time we're able to do that somehow. Very, very nice. And uh, an another thing, I, I just wanted to go back to the whole aliens in the backyard in Vegas for a moment here. Obviously, I think they saw something. Um what do you think they saw there, Lon? I don't know exactly what they saw, but I think they did see something. I mean, the reactions uh, that they they demonstrated seemed that something was amiss. Uh, I don't know if it was interpreted wrong or it was a, you know a matter of perception, like with, with any sighting or any encounter. Uh, but uh, I, I think they saw something that confused them or they weren't sure about, and that's. It kind of went from there. That's right. There's all kinds of stories um, mm. uh, initially about the cops uh, showing up and uh, another, maybe another agency taking away cameras of sorts. Uh, you, you heard mm -hmm. all kinds of things. And whether it was real or not, I thought it was uh, fascinating, just like the whole Miami sighting. I, I think it's fascinating to hear these sort of stories take off again. Even if it's fake, I still like hearing about it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh you know, I, I try to stay away from all from a lot of the conspiracy stuff and get to where I, you know, I'm getting to the the, the heart of it, and uh, I don't like to, you know, I don't like to be uh, uh, investigating things that I, I definitely don't think are true. But then again, there's a big question about what happened in Miami so far, right. and um, we're gonna find out. I mean, I, I think we're gonna, I think we're gonna eventually find out what really did happen. Right, because I don't, and I don't, I don't believe that story that either. Fall. Yeah, I don't believe that story either, just like yourself, Lon, uh, yeah. but just kids fighting with a couple sticks and then all this uh, police response, this major police yeah. response. Uh, it seems a little out of uh, character. Well, I I actually talked to some uh, some news media in, in, uh, in Miami, especially television news media. And uh, from what I understand, uh, the FOIA requests are already going out now. I don't know. I, I did check with, with Miami-Dade, the county offices, and their policy on FOIA requests. And it, it seems to me that they they have a pretty quick response as opposed to a lot of other agencies and uh -huh. such. But um, we'll see. Um, most of what people are in, in the media are, are seeking are, um, are body cams and, and vehicle cams uh, to see what, you know, what was uh, what was actually recorded so uh we'll see what shakes out yeah we'll see what happens um but that that response though was very very wild i've mm -hmm. never seen that many cops respond to anything like that before 
No. No, it was overwhelming. There's no doubt about that. Yes, and of course, we've seen all these uh, alleged videos of an alien walking um, uh, down uh, where the police were. I'm sure you've, yeah, you've seen these. Yeah, I don't know these, what to though. think of that. I, I mean, I looked at the video. I've looked at the stills and everything. And yeah. It, it, it's, it's, it's not really... It's not really convincing, but then again, there's there's something there. Now, is it something that was generated? I, I don't know. Right. Uh, but uh, we'll, we'll just have to wait and see. Yeah, we're going to have to wait and see, no doubt. And, of course, the narrative was that a group of roughly 50 teenagers caused a riot at the Bayside Marketplace, an outdoor mall about mm -hmm. five miles from uh, South Beach. And mm -hmm. um, the cops say no aliens involved, but... Um, we'll, we'll figure all this out, what really went on. Uh, again, this story is ridiculous to me, in my opinion. Uh, no, no way they were responding to just a simple fight. No, that, you know, I, like I said, I have talked to people and uh, to, to kind of gauge the way uh, police down there react to certain situations. Yeah. And quite frankly, the fact that there were 30 to 50 vehicles called at one time uh, for what they say really did happen or, you know, in their minds, what really happened just seems like overkill to me. Oh, so, yeah. um, I, I just don't, I just don't know what to think about it at this point. So, uh, we'll just go ahead and, and, and do the RV and see what comes up and, uh, you know, go from there. Yeah. The, the stories are awesome though. 10 foot aliens out there at the mall, beautiful stuff in mm -hmm. my opinion. Um, and, of course, we had the now very famous UFO jellyfish recording that's taken the Internet by storm. I'm sure you've seen that already. Yeah, I don't know what to make of that. What the hell is that, Lon? <laughs> that is pretty wild. I, I don't know. I, I really don't know. I don't know either, but I, I love it, though. These recordings were pretty amazing. I've never seen uh, that before. I've only have had uh, heard people mention that they've seen, like, a translucent alien... <laughs> sort of a squid looking uh creature in the sky i've heard of these stories for quite some time now so once i finally saw it on video thanks to of all places tmz uh putting <clears throat> out that documentary which is pretty wild in my opinion i never i never thought we would um be seeing tmz throw out these documentaries at all well you know these type of these type of uh either craft or bioform beings we, we, we've gotten those for years and years. I mean, I, I've had pictures and, and video of the, that type of uh, activity sent to me for many years where uh, supposed craft of some type is like a bioform and can uh, change and morph to a certain degree while it's in flight. Um, so it, it, it may be that. I, I, don't know, I don't know where the, the basis is to where these things are supposed to be supposed to be coming from. But, uh, uh, you know, it, it, but this, type of, this type of evidence has come forward before. But this specific incident, I don't know. I, I don't know what to think about it. Yeah, and there's been other cases uh, around the world as well. Uh, I'm, sure, I'm not sure if you've seen that footage either, but um, it, this sort of thing has been captured in different countries already as well yeah which yeah. is pretty cool there's even one where there's a, a where a group of dogs are even reacting to the sort of uh translucent jellyfish like um what, what can we even call this mm. whatever it is that you could see that in a video and the dogs are reacting and i thought well that's not doesn't look like this was faked at all it looks pretty real to me yeah, we've uh, I've investigated uh, what I I like to call a, a mana shape type of uh, bioform uh, that people have been seeing now for about fifteen years. We get it. We get a sighting every once in a while. It's usually actually it's actually usually around water of some type, not necessarily a, a, the ocean, but it can be as small as a river or a pond or such. But uh, many times people see these things. Just literally flying in the air, but they have the shape of a manta ray, and many times they are translucent. Uh, so uh, it, it's a phenomenon that happens more in the east of the of the country. Uh, I think maybe eighty percent of the sightings that I've received over the years have come from the eastern part of the country, in the Mid Atlantic area in particular. So uh, I, I don't know what to think of, of it, but uh, the reports are pretty consistent of that manta ray type of shape mm -hmm. and uh they're flying in the air just like they would if it was a, an actual manta ray in the water so uh, 
it's incredible very interesting stuff, very interesting yeah. stuff. and lon i gotta ask you what do you make of all this sort of a uh, footage and all these sort of sightings that we've been um we, we've all been sort of uh experiencing together um do you think there's any reason why we're seeing so much of these sort of things now i think people are looking for it more than they used to um I think people are cognizant of the uh, of the phenomena more so than before. Uh, they see a lot of AI on TV. They see a lot of recreations on TV. And mm. then when something shows up yeah. supposedly in person, uh, they become very uh, enamored by it. And uh, then they start to wonder what is really going on. I, I, I do believe that... Um, I, and just like I said before, I think 2024 is going to be an interesting year oh, and, yeah. uh, as to what we're going to actually have reported uh, or what actually shakes out. I don't know. But uh, I just got I just I'm optimistic that we're going to have we're yeah. going to keep we're going to be very busy. I'm loving it. I've been enjoying the madness. I'm just been sitting back and letting it all sort of marinate lawn. And these are good times, my friend. There's there's been uh, again, there's been countless eyewitness testimonies and it's difficult to just simply dismiss everyone who makes these sort of claims uh of uh seeing erratic lights in the sky or seeing a dog man in the woods i don't think yeah. any i don't think anyone's lost their minds by the way people are experiencing something very real in my opinion lon well it's just like what we've been doing out in chicago i mean we've been involved with this chicago phantom or chicago mothman wing humanoid phenomena now since it began back in 2011 but actually, there, there were sightings going on before that. And, uh, of course, in 2017 is when all this blew up and we started getting multiple sightings per week. And, uh, you know, that, I mean, that case in total has really blown my mind. I mean, it's like the cryptid that keeps on giving. Uh, and we've been, we've been constantly been busy with it. Now, there, there has been a bit of a, a lull in the uh, e-activity this year. Uh, 2023, I think we had seven reports come in, uh, and that's that's pretty that's pretty low as compared to what we have had. But we've had we've had periods before where it's been slow. So I I do believe that that may be picking up eventually too. Uh, as to what these things are, mm -hmm. we really don't know. I, I personally believe it's an interdimensional being of some type. I don't think it's indigenous. I don't think I do believe it's a flesh and blood being. I think it's corporeal, and uh, but I think it has the ability to move within our dimension into another. And um, I, I think a lot of cryptids and a lot of other phenomena have that same dynamic to where they can move in and out very quickly. Absolutely, we always ask, where do these UFOs come from, and where does this uh, Bigfoot come from? And sure. it always ties back to perhaps these are interdimensional beings or entities of sorts. And I'm starting to believe much more in that hypothesis, my friend. I think even Jacques Vallée was uh, early on uh, saying the same thing. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I've been involved with, with the cryptids and paranormal now for 40 years, I would say. Years. Yeah, my friend, you've been yeah, in the game. It's been a long time. Yes. And I, I have such a and, tremendous respect for you, by the way, Lon. I know that. Well, I appreciate that. Yeah. You've been going uh, hard for a long time, my friend. And, uh, you know, more and more people who were strictly flesh and blood indigenous are, are starting to realize that there's another, there's got to be something else going on here. Um, I mean, the fact that we just don't have enough physical evidence to really make any conclusions uh, that, that these beings may very well for the most part. Now, I'm not saying there are no indigenous Bigfoot, in, for example. I think in the Pacific Northwest and Florida and down around the Gulf and other areas, there, there may very well be groups of these beings that do live on our Earth plane and, and do reproduce. But for the most part, I think much of what people have been seeing and just not with Bigfoot, have been some type of being that has the ability to move between worlds or dimensions or whatever you want to define it as. And um, I, I think a lot of uh, a lot of old time investigators are starting to keep get a more open mind about the phenomena and, and starting to consider the possibilities. And you mentioned the O'Hare sightings. Can you um, mm -hmm. brief our listeners a little bit about that situation for those who aren't fully aware of what we're talking here? Um, 
about? Well, the this winged humanoid phenomena, which has been equated to the actual Mothman of Point Pleasant, but quite frankly, there's there's just not a whole lot of similarity. Uh, these are more humanoid with uh, membrane type wings. That the many do have the red eye, but that's kind of where it ends. Uh, the sightings are very fleeting sightings. There's there's very little aggression. Uh, by the time someone realizes that they're looking at something and they they pull out a phone, this thing is gone. Uh, but the sightings that have hair. Uh, they, they basically started in the neighborhoods around O'Hara mostly, and um, uh, then it started picking up inside the uh, the airport itself. Now, there, there, there is a specific area where most of these sightings are being seen, and it's in the, the uh, southwest part of the, the airport, where there's a lot of cargo areas, plus a graveyard, actually. There's a cemetery there. Oh, okay. I didn't and, know that. Yeah, there, there is a cemetery at O'Hara. And Ooh, um, interesting. Yeah, I, I well, it, it it seems that a lot of the sightings have been concentrated ar around that cemetery. Now, mm -hmm. I don't really know if there's a connection there. I, I kind of think there is, but we just don't have the evidence at this point to prove that. But some of the neighborhoods around um, are around O'Hare, like uh, Bensonville to the southwest or to the east, we have. Um, uh, Rosemont and, and other neighborhoods around uh, around O'Hare have been experiencing a lot of sightings. So it's just not necessarily in, in the airport itself, but we have had uh, personnel and, and people who have worked at the airport give us reports. But uh, to this point, unfortunately, we just don't have the, the photographic evidence and it's all anecdotal. So, uh, and many times these people are very reluctant to come forward. Uh, and what they do tell you is kind of mundane or very generic because the first thing they fear is losing their job. And right. many of these people have been warned about it. Uh, I, I do have a, a CEO uh, at O'Hare who, who works for you know, a supervisor of one of the airlines, and they have confirmed many sightings uh, and, and that their employees have told them. And wow. uh, so I know there's something going on there, but the, the the biggest problem at this point is getting people to come forward. Yeah, as, as usual. Actually, right. Yeah, and to really stick to the story, and and to kind of not be you know not be so fearful of what can be done to them. Though I I, I get it. I mean, they're they're, they're working at very well paid jobs, and they just don't want to sacrifice that. And uh, you know, when you've got a uh, a security person telling you or a supervisor telling you to n not report it or they're going to lose their job, then it can, tends to be a problem. And Oh, yeah. Uh, they have warned. They, they have used us by name to warn people just not to contact us. Uh, I have had several witnesses tell me that. Really? And, um, does, that, oh, yeah. the, does that alarm you at all, on? That there's someone really. out there that are. I, I, I'm kind of okay. used to that. Um, yeah. And you know, I the response from from the uh, the powers that be at at O'Hare, uh, it doesn't surprise me. Uh, but uh, you know, even with the sightings in Chicago itself, we we got no cooperation from the police department, uh, even after submitting FOIA requests or any other services, even City Hall. City Hall has been mum about the whole thing. Yikes. Uh, many times we have uh, asked for a video, supposed video, from uh, businesses through security companies, and we've just not been successful in getting any of that. Uh, it's not that they, they uh, state that nothing was seen. It's just that we will not provide you anything. We don't have permission to provide you with any evidence. Mm. That's got to be frustrating. That is frustrating. Yeah, I, I can imagine. But, you know, there's something weird uh, that, that's going on out there at, at O'Hare. You know, um, th there's been UFO sightings, and the most famous one was mm -hmm. back in 2006, if you remember. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, uh, we've had weird. UFO sightings yeah. associated with this phenomenon, too. Uh, we've, had, uh, we've had at least two um, where these beings would show up and then a UFO or UAP would show up. Um, I don't think these beings are associated with it for for whatever reason i i think 
they, they are either just showing up because of them being there, but uh, I don't think there's any real connection to it. And um, mm-hmm. There have been other humanoid sightings as well. Uh, that people have made uh, in the uh, the green areas, in the forested areas around O'Hare and all through uh, the Chicago uh, suburbans areas. Um, even at O'Hare, we've had several. So uh, Rosemont as well. Rosemont has had a lot of um, humanoid sightings. I wonder what of, what's uh, going. I wonder what that's a, or such. Yeah, I wonder what that's about. Uh, obviously, there's something going know. on out there in O'Hare Airport. Whatever is around there, maybe the cemetery, maybe it goes back to Indians, perhaps. Um, matter of fact, you would, if if you were Native American, you would uh, think they were skinwalkers. Well, you know, the area has a rich uh, Native American history. Uh, it, it's been well known and well as far as the lore about flying creatures, uh, flying cryptids. Uh, so it's not really something that's that unusual. The fact that these are more humanoid as opposed to some type of other flying creature, like a Thunderbird or possibly a pterosaur type looking being. Uh, you know, it, 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 it is, it is a bit fascinating, but, uh, you know the fact that we've got all these sightings in an urban area yeah uh is just it's just something that's just really never happened before yeah that's what i'm so, saying there's um, like there, there's got to be some sort of a like a portal almost yeah well you would think uh it's just a matter of us being able to distinguish that but uh, like i said before at this point we just we just don't have that right and looking at the background there um behind you it, it seems like that that's a mothman right there for those uh mm-hmm. that are only listening in to this uh through the um i guess the audio version of this uh later on the podcast version for those who can't see there is a beautiful mothman like creature looks like it's swooping in on something what is that a, a duck a geese it's some type of bird i think it's crane oh a crane yeah yeah i think it's a crane uh, I, that, that supposedly the Mothman at Point Pleasant, the area has a lot of cranes. Um, and there's one above that of the Chicago Mothman. Uh, so, um, yeah, we, uh, these, these prints are the original art was done by Sam Sharon, who's, uh, he's kind of a cryptic horror artist and I do enjoy his art. So, uh, yeah, yeah I, that's why I've got it. Very nice. What would you say Mothman is your favorite line of the cryptid? Yeah, it is. It is. It's, it's, you know, it's something that I, I, I just spound to, I guess. Um, I've always been fascinated with the, the wing humanoid wing being, uh, phenomena. Uh, I guess it's crazy enough for me to be interested. In it. <laughs> so, uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I am. And, uh, it, it's kind of worked out that way. I've been lucky enough to have been involved with some pretty interesting investigations. I know. That's pretty awesome. And the very first sign, I believe, was way back uh 1966 in West Virginia. Mm-hmm. That might have been the very, the very first of Mothman sighting, if I recall correctly. Uh, I might be wrong, but I think I'm not. I think that is quite accurate. And uh, Mothman, I mean... Who doesn't like any kind of Mothman story? You got those awesome bright red eyes that everyone seems to be afraid of, but actually I'm not afraid of it. I've always been quite fascinated with the Mothman. I'm not sure why, but that's a really badass cryptid in my opinion. It's interesting. I mean, it's uh, that that 66 to 67 uh, uh, period where a lot of these sightings were taking place around the... uh, uh, around the Mason County area in Point Pleasant. Uh, that's kind of the standard. Um, and unfortunately for, for us, or for me, I guess, when we started getting these studies in Chicago, I was actually calling it the Chicago fan. Oh, okay. I didn't, I, I tried to stay away from the Mothman moniker as much as I could because quite frankly, what people were seeing was just not what people were seeing in Point Pleasant. But of course, the press got a hold of it, media, and they started calling it the Mothman. So I went along with it just to keep people from being confused. <laughs> uh, so uh, yeah, we went along with that. Yeah, uh, so very it's nice. Kind of taking on a life of its own. Absolutely. And did you ever watch the movie The Mothman Prophecies? Please say yes. Yeah, I did. Ah, did you like that? 
the movie was good. The book was better. Uh, yeah, I agree. The book is always better, but the yeah. Mathmon Prophecies, uh, if a throwback to 2002, a great film. If you haven't seen it yet, I would recommend anyone uh, that's in interested in any of this to uh, check it out. It's quite a fun movie, in my opinion. And of course, that brings me to ask you, what what kind of, uh, what exactly motivates you a lot to sort of uh, delve into the mysterious and unexplained? You know, it's it's something that's been around me all my life, actually. Um, I had my first real paranormal event that I can remember is when I was around nine years old. And, uh, you know, I am an intuitive. I, I, I do sense certain things, certain yeah. energies. Uh, I've always been like that. It, it, you know, I've kind of used it more and sometimes more than others, but it's, it's kind of an up and down thing with me over the years because I've gotten more deep into, uh, the cryptid activity and, and more and more it's, it's kind of, uh, it's kind of helped me in my investigation. Interesting. And, um, I was going to ask you if maybe perhaps your experiences have maybe, you know, sort of swayed you to just sort of believe, I, I don't get offended, but to sort of believe everyone's story because you yourself are an experiencer. And yeah. I say that because I myself have experienced a number of insane things that I, I just can't explain, but actually have photographs of a few things that I've encountered in my time as well. So maybe my opinions are a little bit swayed a certain way. Maybe I'm a little biased. I'm wondering if uh, that's if you experienced that yourself. Well, I I I do give people the benefit of the doubt at first. Okay, uh, fair fair enough. You know, I I'm pretty good at separating the wheat from the chaff after a while. Uh, there are points where, and most like, and, and many times a witness will, will see something, and uh, especially a cryptid, and they'll try to they'll try to uh, expound on that sometimes or uh, try to make it bigger than what it really is just to satisfy you. And I can usually pick up on that. And uh, mm, that's when yeah. I usually will get very serious with them and, and try to figure out what exactly they did see. Uh, but it does happen. Uh, and, and everybody experience, everybody who does this type of thing, they experience that from time to time. Uh, but no, I've always been one to give, folks the benefit of the doubt let them tell their story uh uh let them get it out of their system but when they start right. uh <laughs> when they start exaggerating a bit mm. or uh you can usually tell you could kind of, yeah you, yeah you could kind of tell so in other words you do have some discernment amongst yourself oh well, yeah obviously. you always have to yeah okay uh, you got to be a skeptic to a to a point uh i'm not a skeptic to a fault but i i, I do have some skepticism with some things i I hear, but when yeah. people start embellishing, it, it, it tends to be a problem. Yeah, you could kind of tell. And of course, I'm glad to hear that there is a line in the sand for you uh, because there is one for me as well. And certain things I could believe or disbelieve. Yeah. And um, going back to, I guess, one of your earliest sightings, maybe it might have been your first. Um, uh, you, you saw a Bigfoot, I think, if I recall correctly, way back in the day. Yeah, I had a Bigfoot encounter in 1981. Can you can you tell us a little bit about that? I find that a uh, rather interesting, um, es especially from someone like myself who, you know, along the lines here, all these years down the road, I kind of stopped believing in Bigfoot. Well, what happened was um, I was living in Sykesville, Maryland at the time. Uh, it was May 9th, nineteen eighty one. I was uh, I was actually fly fishing on the South Branch of Tapsco River, which is about a mile downstream from um, from Sykesville, Maryland. It's an area I've been to a lot. Uh, and, uh, up to that point, I had never seen anything or had anything happen to me, but I was, I was in the river in hip waders, just fly fishing for small mouth and rock bass and, uh, and noticed a dog across on the North bank. And I didn't pay much mind until the dog yelped. And when the dog yelped, I looked over and then I saw something huge stand up in the weeds. Now, I don't know what it did to the dog. I don't know if it hit it or, or what it did, but, um, uh, this thing stood up. Now, the weeds were pretty high. Uh, I, I got about mid-body uh, that I could see. They were thick, too. But this thing started walking to my left and walked out of the weeds onto the riverbank and just stood there looking at me. And we were about 40 foot apart. We were really close because the river is not wide there. And uh, 
this thing was about seven to eight, seven and a half to eight foot in height, had a somewhat conical head, uh, very dark brown, some matted hair, very muscular, uh, definitely a male because of the genitalia was was visible. Um, but the, the one thing that, that kind of stood out to me was the face looked more human than ape. Now, I had a very large brow ridge on it. Uh, you know, the first thing I, when I talk to people about it, it looked like a Neanderthal or what people represent as a Neanderthal or an early man. But, uh, yeah, this, uh, this thing was, we were locked eyes for about 10 seconds, maybe. Wow. It was making a clicking sound. I think it was gnashing its teeth. I think that's how it responded to seeing me. But, uh, you know, after about 10 seconds or so, it just, quickly turned and, and walked up into the woods. It didn't run, but it, it, it swiftly went up into the woods. So what I did, I got I quickly got out of the river and got right into my car. Yeah. And uh, I drove into into Sykesville, found the first um, phone I could, and I um, called the police. Now, back in 1981, you know, Bigfoot was kind of coming into this, into uh uh, the mainstream, the mainstream, I guess. Yeah. It, it, but it really wasn't. You know, people had talked about it. you had the, the, the Gimlin film and Patterson Gimlin film and the uh, the uh, uh, some of the other movies that were made around that time. And uh, you know, it, it was in the vernacular, but people just didn't really know much about it. I assumed it was a Bigfoot, but you know, I wasn't really sure. But anyway, I, I called the police, told them what I had seen. The girl on the other side of the phone said, well, go back to where you were and we'll send a police officer out there. And I'm thinking, well, the last thing I want to do is go back Let's down. Go back there. there, yeah. But I did. I got in the car. But to my surprise, and this was only like a four-minute drive back, there was already a Maryland State police officer standing there with these the old wooden barriers across the road. And it's not a very big road. Yeah. But... Uh, yeah, he, he had that already there. So right then and there, I, I thought, well, they've been following. Something was following. You, you know, something's going on here. So when I pulled up the police officer, he told me, he said, roll your, you know, motion to roll my window down. He said, you got to leave. I said, well, I made the call to Sykesville Police, and they told him to come back. I said, I don't care. you got to go. Okay. Well, That's I wanted to argue with him, so I, yeah. I, I left. Hmm. So I went back home. Uh, stayed home about an hour or so. Then I thought to myself, well, I'm going back out there to see what's going on. So I did. I drove out. And by the time I got there, I mean, there were cars everywhere. I mean, it, it was just flooded with people. And they had people going in and out of the woods and the weeds and stuff with dogs. Must have been a half dozen of those. Wow. They had a big white tent set up across the river. Uh, all jurisdictions, all police departments in the area were there. I mean, sheriff, state police and county police, local police, everybody was there. And there were two black wagoners sitting there. And back that time, that's what the feds used to drive. So, uh, and I heard a helicopter, didn't see one, but I heard one. So uh, I walked up to the barrier and this Howard County police officer was standing there. And I said hello to him. I said, so what's going on? I said, I, I was going to drive through here and you're all blocked. He said, well, somebody said they saw a Bigfoot. He was kind of half joking. Well, I didn't tell him I'm the one that made the report. I mean, you know, I didn't want anybody to question me anytime. Anyway, smart. So, smart uh, move. Smart move. I took, I, I decided, well, okay. So I just, I set, stood there for a couple minutes and got out of there and went back home. So what I did, I, I called the three TV stations in Baltimore at the time and uh, talked to their news editors and told them what I had witnessed. And what was going on? And uh, they, they, all three of them said, "Well, we get back to you. Give us your number and everything." And that's okay. So five days later, nobody called me. So I called one of the stations, WMER. I talked to the news editor. He said, "I can't talk to you," and hung up on me. Well, mm -hmm. then I knew something was up. Yeah. So as the years went by, I became more and more curious as to what happened. I eventually had a, a Sightsville police officer contact me, who was there. And he verified everything that I had seen, everything that was going on there. And, uh, you know, I became more and more interested in cryptids. And, you know, I had never been interested in Bigfoot or anything like that before. Yeah. So I, uh, I I did find out that seven years previous to my sighting, there was what they called the Sykesville Monster Incident, where this most likely a Bigfoot was going 
into homes and property and such and causing ruckus and going into chicken pens oh. and such. And uh, I, uh, there was a gentleman who I worked with who lived down in that neighborhood. Uh, it's an African American. It was an African American neighborhood at the time. There's a lot, you know, a lot of family lived down there, and they all knew, you know, they were all associated with each other, so they knew who each and everybody was. Yeah. Because when the reports came out early in the 70s, uh, the Afro American newspaper in Baltimore was the the initial reporting of the incident are the incidents. So uh, I, I was able to talk to those witnesses that were still there, plus several others who had encounters with this thing, and, and little to the point where this beast was getting into homes, getting into garages. There was one police officer in, in Sykesville who literally went up to one of the doors, access to, the, um, to one of these uh, garages, and this thing knocked the door down on top of a police officer. Oh, to get out. Jeez. So, uh, yeah. So I've kind of, I kind of heard a whole lot of what happened. So I became more and more interested, and that kind of where my whole cryptid that was. Yeah, that was the catalyst. Started. Yeah, that was the catalyst for you, Lon. That's what uh, kicked yeah. it off for you. Very interesting. Yeah, I was going to ask you what exactly, what what specific event it was that sort of got you started, but it seems like you answered that one for me already. Yeah, that um, was it. That, that, was that it. kind of okay. started. That got the, the snowball going. I get you. I mean, I I would I would be this. I would be uh, the exact same way as you if I came across something like that. And especially since the police were there already when you returned back, uh, long yeah. that that's kind of a dead giveaway. It makes me makes me think that perhaps there was other things already being reported in that area, and they thought, well, holy crap, we can't just sit around. We got to get out of here. Well, what happened was I did find out later after this, the BFRO started up in 1995 and started taking reports yeah. uh, that there was a sighting and report three hours before mine downstream. Oh, So this woman who had the encounter, uh, she called police. Now, I don't think that's what really got the manhunt going. I think this thing escaped from somewhere. Now, I, I, I can't be for sure about that. You know, people who live in the Baltimore, Washington area know there's a lot of facilities that are people mm. just don't know what's going on. There. Right. And uh, I, I think I think that may very well have been something connected to that. I don't know for sure, but I think something was going on that involved the government. Now, you know, the fact that they had that response that they did just it just seems unconscionable to me, even nowadays. I don't think they'd ever respond like that. So right, um, right. there was a rhyme and reason for it. That's what I'm thinking. Something must have been going on in that area prior to uh, your call as well. Uh, maybe it was an escaped sort of lab experiment of sorts. You don't really know, but have there been stories no. of that been going on for a long time? Of course. I, these are uh, stories that you think are uh, just uh, tales of legend, but uh, people actually see these sort of things and... Uh, going back, uh, I mean, even a few years later, I, I understand you also had another encounter with a winged humanoid uh, back yeah, in 1988. Uh, back in 1988. Um, yeah, I was. Um, how old were you then, by the way, Adlon, if you don't mind me asking, back in 88? In 88, I was 20. I was 30. You were 30. I was so just getting ready to turn 30 in 88. So when I had the encounter in 80, 81, I was uh, 23 or 24. I see. But. Uh, what happened was I was living in Baltimore at the time when I, because I was born and raised in this area. Okay. And I told you I was east of Gettysburg. Yeah. Uh, and then when I, I got out of high school and a bit of college, I went ahead and moved down to Baltimore. And I lived down there for almost 40 years, raised a family. And uh, eventually, uh, when my wife passed, my son and I decided to move back up here. So we've been up here since 2016 again. And, uh, but anyway... I, I was down. In, I was down at Timonium Fairground, which is an area, with the old state uh, state fair area north of Baltimore. And there was some type of Boy Scout Boy Scout get together going on down there. And uh, I, I was actually antiquing. I was at another one of the other buildings, and I happened to walk in there by chance. Yeah. And uh, I ran into uh, a gentleman who I went to school with up in Pennsylvania, and he was a scout leader. And he and I actually were in scouts together. Um, so uh, 
you know, we, we, when we were kids, we used to hang out together on the old, on the battlefield uh, at nighttime when you could go out there at night and camp and, you know, not be run off by the Rangers. Nice. So but, you, uh, you, must, you must have experienced something out there as well. I experienced a lot. A out lot. There, yeah. I would have Over the years. Yeah. Oh, shit. So, uh, anyway, uh, I hadn't seen him in about a dozen years. So, you know, we got to talking and, uh, we were sitting there eating lunch and, uh, he, he stated, you know, he said, I know you're still into the paranormal stuff. Um, me and another scout leader are going up to Camp Conewago. And this is an old campsite we used to go to as kids and it's still around actually. Uh, we're going up to Camp Conewago and, uh, do some investigating out there. He said, now this was it. Now when I met up with him, it was in, it was in October, early October. So, uh, he said all summer long this in eight, that year in 88, a lot of troops have been going in and camping at the, at the camp, but they'd be hearing these screaming sounds. It was scaring the kids and they were packing up and leaving out early. And it happened several times. So they, they wanted to find out what was going on. So, um, he said, are you game? How about tagging along with this? And I said, well, okay. So, you know, back at the time when I didn't mind sleeping on the ground, I don't think I'd do it anymore. Couldn't get up. But uh, we went out <laughs> camping. Anyway, yeah. I met them up at Camp Conewago the next Friday. And uh, we walked out, hiked out in, into the camping area, into the woods, along the creek, along the trail. And we set up camp. Uh, had everything going about 6 o'clock that evening. And we just stuck around the campsite. Nothing was going on. It was very quiet. Uh, so that night was fairly quiet. But in the morning when we woke up, uh, the other guy who was with us stated, uh, did you hear anything walking around the camp? And I did. I thought maybe one of those guys was walking around, you know, relieving themselves in the woods or whatever. I, I didn't know what it was. But, you know, I didn't know. What, it, but none of them said they were. So, um, right. but nothing in the campsite was disturbed. So I didn't pay much mind. So what we wanted to do that day on Saturday was hike throughout the woods. You know, there's a state game land there, too. There's There's a lot of wildlife and a lot of weird things out there. Uh, it's got a history for a lot of strange activity. So we spent most of the day in the woods. So when we um, when we got back after being out all day, it was around six in the evening again. It was just starting to turn dusk, and uh, we sat down eight and uh, we sat around at the campfire most of the night. Nothing was going on. We didn't hear a thing. Talking football and whatever guys talk about. You know, we weren't drinking. We were just we were sober and we were just. And just relaxing. And, it would have been uh, better if you, were, if you were drinking. What's that? Oh, I said it would have been better if you were got, if you guys were drinking. Well, maybe. Yeah, of course. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Good times. Yeah. But uh, uh, about 10 o'clock or so, I think it was around that time, we heard the screaming sound coming out of the woods west of us. Ooh. I, I didn't know what it was. That's pretty I, scary. I, I, first thing I thought was it was an animal screaming. You know, animals scream a lot. They make a lot of crazy right. sounds. Right, right. Could have been a bobcat. Could have been anything. So... I didn't pay it much mind. We we thought about it and, you know, so we just sat down and started talking. It's more of about an hour, hour and a half later, then we heard a blood curling scream. Now, it literally sounded like a woman screaming. It was that loud, shrill, and it, it, it was really Oof. something I had never heard before. And uh, that kind of got our attention. Then we were wondering what the heck was out there. So uh, so we decided then we're staying, we're staying up for the night. Uh, we're going to see or try to figure out what this is. Well, we sat there and we were talking and keeping an eye out and listening and the whole nine yards. But after a while, I guess around one o'clock, I, I started getting stiff and all. So I got up to stretch my legs and I walked out onto the trail, which was between the campsite and, and the creek. And I just had this really strange feeling like something was watching us. You know you, how you get that feeling. Like something oh, yeah. just is is not right oh yeah so i walked back to the campfire and I, I told those guys look why don't we get our flashlights go out on the trail walk up and down the trail see if we see anything okay we're not doing anything else so that's what we'll do so we got our flashlights back to back to back walking out on the trail we didn't get 50 foot away from that campsite when we saw this thing and it was standing in the creek now the creek was really low that time of year uh the moonlight was bright enough to where we could see most anything or make out shapes really well. But we saw the red eyes. And I mean, these things were like tail lights on a car. It was projecting light. It wasn't reflecting. It was projecting light. 
and by the t it was standing right out in the middle of the creek. And by the time we got our flashlights on this thing, it literally jettisoned into the air with a whooshing sound. And when it reached its apex, it let out a terrifying scream and took off. Now, we didn't know what to think. We we're freaking out. So we literally run right back to the campsite, even though it was right there. And uh, my buddy isn't talking. We're sitting around the campfire. He's not saying a word. He doesn't know what the hell just happened. The other guy and I were talking. He said, did you notice anything on its back? And I did. I noticed it looked like it had wings on the back, but it did not unfurl. Uh, this thing was pretty good size. It was about six foot, I'd say, but the wings extend away over the top of the body. But I never saw the wings unfurl. But this thing literally jettisoned in the air like a rocket. I mean, it just took off. Wow. So the wings weren't, weren't what made it jettison the way it did. So uh, those two guys went up and spent the night in the administration building that night. I stayed down at the campsite. I was up all night. I was trying to listen for whatever it was or get a sight on it, but uh, nothing else happened. So uh, when, literally, you know, I didn't really talk a whole lot about the incident. A few people I had talked to about it, uh, but I kind of kept quiet for over the years. I, but about 20 years later, after I had started the blog back in 2005, I think it was around 2008, I went ahead and wrote about it. I wrote, now, I wrote about the Sykesville thing, and I wrote about that. And when I wrote about this red eye, and now they call it old red eye. It's, it's, it's a legend of old red eye now. <laughs> oh, yeah. And uh, But anyway, uh, I had a gentleman who lived at Dick's Dam who lived just downstream from where we were. And he contacted me after reading it and said, look, you know, I've been hearing something screaming around here for 20 years. I didn't know what it was. Mm. Maybe it was the same thing that you guys experienced, which could have been. I don't know. But a couple of weeks later, I got another email from a scout leader who had been out to Camp Conawaga with his troop just weeks prior to that and said that one day, that Saturday, when the kids were out messing around on the trail, they came running back, screaming and yelling and hollering that they had seen a dragon on the trail. Ooh. And he said, I thought they were pulling my leg. He said, they look serious, but, you know, we didn't leave. We, they, they weren't scared enough that they were going to leave. But... uh he he didn't know what to make, but after he read my account, he said, well, maybe they did see something. So over the years, since that time, I have taken five reports of similar sightings along the Conewago Creek, not necessarily right there at Camp Conewago, but the creek goes west, excuse me, it goes east, uh, and it goes into the Susquehanna River about 15 to 16 miles east of there. So there have been other sightings along the creek uh, and all the sightings have been very similar to what I saw. Then fast forward to 2011 and 2017, when all this stuff is starting in Chicago, I'm dumbfounded by what we're, the reports we're getting because it's very similar, similar to what I saw. Yeah, so that must have really... Very similar to what yeah. I saw. So uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if I was predestined or whatever. People think seem to say that instead of being a synchronicity thing, it's just my, me and my head and I'm just making this up. And it, no, I mean, it, it, it's, I'm still fascinated by it. Yeah. I don't, I don't and, think you're making uh, it up at all. Um, you, you really did see, um, something, um, you know, whether it was Mothman or whatever it, it, it was, but you, you saw who something. Knows what it was. Yeah. You don't know. Who knows what it was. Yeah. Um, you, you hear all but, these you know, reports. In, in Pennsylvania, we've had several of these sightings throughout right. the state. I right. mean, uh, these these winged humanoids are, uh, they are seen. I mean, I mean, I did a report about it last last week on my blog. I mean, on my blog, on my YouTube channel. Yeah. Uh, the Keystone Phantoms, I called it. And uh, I talk about a lot of these sightings of these winged humanoids throughout Pennsylvania. And uh, what, what do you, what exactly do you think they are, though? In your opinion, I, I have I, no idea. I still think there's some sort of interdimensional entity of sorts. Very could, very well could be. It, it very well could be. It seems uh, like it because these things are able to sort of like manifest and then just disappear. Yeah, I mean the sightings are fleeting sightings. I mean it, they're very quick sightings. They don't last. They lay, always last thirty seconds or less than a minute. Uh, and by the time somebody sees it, thinks about getting their phone out to get a photograph, it's gone. Now, we've had some indiscernible photographs taken. Right. But nothing that we're, we could really define what it was. Yeah, that's uh, interesting. You know, material phone cameras, yeah. Phone cameras don't have the great, greatest pixel definition, so uh, you take what you get. Absolutely. These things seem to dematerialize and materialize again, and 
it's rather uh it's rather wild a lot of these reports but yes they sort of uh appear and disappear very much like uh ufos or uaps and uh, i still refuse to use that term uap uh, yeah, I'll take care for it. <laughs> I, yeah I, I think that that whole thing stinks in my opinion I, I rather just use the term flying saucer i'm old school yeah yeah I, the new age coming into uh uf ufology is kind of uh yeah, it, it's not it's not really reached to me yet. I mean, I, I'm just not used to using those terms. I don't like those terms myself. Um, <laughs> I, I hate them, to be honest. And again, law on your website, uh, well, the investigation sort of site, the cryptidhunters.org. Uh, mm -hmm. Definitely uh, go there, ladies and gentlemen, if you want to hear more about these sort of things. And again, you've been investigating for about 40 years or so, I, I, I would imagine, my friend. And... Uh, 40, 45 years. 45 plus. years. Damn. Um, that's crazy. Yeah. yeah. I mean, actual doing actual investigations. So, yeah. I mean, but I'm 65 now. But I've been, most of my life has been paranormal. And I respect that tremendously, my friend. And again, I, I going back to the whole interdimensional thing, you know, I've heard wild stories about um, people communicating with Bigfoot, even. I've heard mm -hmm. a lot of these stories and. It's it's strange because there's some correlation there with these stories of uh, Bigfoot and UFO seen in the same vicinity, basically. And it, this may sound like a major stretch to some folks out there, and I understand that completely, but there was even an individual I was talking to many moons ago, and he was telling me about his story out in uh, Mount Shasta. And this mm -hmm. gentleman was telling me that he was communicating maybe through some sort of form of telepathy with a Bigfoot, and then a UFO appeared in the sky, and then both of these sort of things, they sort of demat dematerialized out of nowhere. And uh, I had a difficult time processing that story myself, but I've learned throughout time um, that there is a small demographic out there who have experienced this phenomenon for themselves, Lon, and I think that is pretty, pretty gnarly. I mean, I wish I could say I communicated with a Bigfoot and saw a UFO take off too. I've seen some UFOs um, myself, but... A Bigfoot, that's a whole nother, it's a whole nother thing. Yeah, well, I've, I, I've, you know, Pennsylvania has had a, a few high profile cases where uh, UFOs had been seen and, uh, and Bigfoot had been associated or, or seemed to show up later. Now, if they were actually connected to the UFO, I don't know, is it happenstance? It could be, but yeah. it, it just seems awful unusual that the, these two things end up at one point. Um, I, I tell you what pretty well convinced it for me, uh, convinced me of it was I got involved with a habituation, a Bigfoot habituation up in, uh, in the North shore of, uh, Nova Scotia back in 2010, 2011, where this, uh, this gentleman who had a small farm, Bigfoot on his, uh, his property and they were living and they had, you know, they had family groups and everything Ooh. and he was getting he was doing a lot of sketching of these things, but he was getting some video on cameras as well. Uh, and, and he was telling me these encounters he was having. His his grandson actually had an encounter with one of them as well. But anyway, uh, when a lot of this started for him, he started seeing a lot of UFO activity to the point where he literally saw, and this is, you know, and I believe it. The guy was very, very forthcoming. Where he saw a large oval shaped craft descend in the field in front of his house, Ooh. and a Bigfoot got out of it. Now, he said there was another creature that got out of it. Uh, it, it I don't know what the hell this thing was because it, it, it was kind of feathered and it had large turkey like feet, but the Bigfoot and this other creature came out at the same time. Now, you know, it is what it is. Right. I mean, I, I do know, and he showed me evidence of it where. He he was a pig farmer actually, and uh, many times these Bigfoot would get in and try to grab pigs, and some of the pigs were injured on many occasions, mm. and uh, yeah, so uh, they had claw marks on them, some flesh was ripped off and such. So uh, and then these things were killing chickens, and uh, many times he would find dead chickens on his front porch. Uh, so um, they they weren't the kindest beast, but. Uh, he knew they were there, and other than that, they weren't really causing much problem. But unfortunately, he passed away. Oh, 
and the farm got sold maybe no. three years later. I, mm. you know, it took me a while to figure out what had happened to him. But he, he, he was terminal when he started, we, we started getting him. And in fact, I was supposed to go up there and then he passed. Oh, that sucks. But, um, yeah. yeah, it was unfortunate. But okay. uh, I believe, I, I really do. Uh, Nova Scotia, even though it's not a, a huge island, it's got a lot of, um, it's got a lot of weird activity. A lot, of, sign- yeah, activity. A lot of sightings out there too. Yeah. Kind of yeah. like Mount Shasta. A lot of these areas, they are just filled hot, with hot areas. Yeah. Yeah. It's a very... Pennsylvania's got a lot of these hot areas. Yeah. Pennsylvania uh, as well. That's what uh, makes this state mm-hmm. pretty unique. You got a lot of, a uh, lot of stories that come out of there. A lot of dogman yeah. sightings as well. Oh yeah. We've been, uh, we've been busy with the, uh, the cryptic canines. Uh, we're working that. on four cases right now. Very and, nice. And, uh, in, in locally, actually, oh, locally, so okay. in the South Central Pennsylvania and, and North Central Maryland area, we've had uh, we've had some sightings uh, are, are, within the last two years oh, that we're looking into. Oh my! So the, yeah, these are yeah. recent. Okay. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. In fact, the one sighting was like two miles as the flow cries uh, as the crow flies from Camp David uh, up in the Katakan Mountains. So uh, this. Uh, you know, there's a lot of government stuff around here. Uh, you've got uh, you've got Raven Rock, which is the underground Pentagon. You've got Camp David, and you've got a few places south, Berkeley, and such. Um, but there is definitely UFO and uh, a lot of uh, cryptic canine and Bigfoot activity around this area. So, uh, but I'm quite sure the power to be, they know what's going on around here. Very interesting. Very very interesting, and. Another thing I wanted to ask you here, I know we are sort of coming to an end uh, pretty soon here, mm-hmm. but I was going to ask you, what do you make of the mass number of missing people in national parks in the United States? I don't know what to think about that. I don't uh, either. I don't quite either. frankly, mm-hmm. I, I don't doubt it. I have talked to many search and rescue people over the years who have gone out and looking for people and found them in the most random places, unbelievable right? places. Yeah. Right. Uh, I mean, like on the top of a, r- a mountain on a cliff or something like that, where a kid would, like a child would found it. And, and they don't know no how. They got there. Yeah, and they don't know how they got uh, there. No. Yeah. And, um, but I've also heard stories about people just simply disappearing and, and not ever being seen again. Now, you know, it, it's one of three things. An animal's getting to them, but it's not leaving any trace, which is kind of hard for me to believe. Uh, they were either abducted somehow by something or they step through a portal. And I, I I do believe the portal explanation may very well have some validity. Um, now, why I say that, I don't know. I mean, I, I say that from just some of the stuff that people have told me over the years, uh, though they, they really can't define a portal or, but many times when people have gone through these things and come out, they will describe it as going into another reality, even though it's very, very close to what they came out of. Mm. But there are slight differences. Yeah, uh, it's, an it's alternate, rea- alternate reality of some type, possibly. Do people go through these things and just get irretrievably lost? That's also a possibility. Right. I, I think that offers more explanation as to what's going on than anything else at this point. Right. I definitely believe there might be a portal or what they call an X point or electron diffusion region. If you want to get a very, you know, scientific Possibly. with it, but I'm, I'm starting to believe that that theory myself, my friend, there's been so many uh, missing people in national parks that you've got to wonder, are they being hunted by uh, hunted by the cartel? But I would uh, imagine they're too busy growing the the dope, the weed, that uh, fine cannabis out yeah, there. Yeah, I, I don't think I, you know. I, in maybe some cases in certain areas. I mean, Pacific Northwest, Northern California, in areas where they're they're growing areas and stuff. Yeah, that may very well be true. But there's, but there's I, just too I many. Just, you know, people just yeah. don't fall off the face of the earth like right. that. I mean, right. you know, there's there's usually some type of uh, forensic evidence of some type to to get a pretty good idea of what actually happened. But many of these, uh, many of these uh, 411 mysteries or right. uh, disappearances offer no clue whatsoever. It's very interesting. Very, very interesting. And I, I don't know exactly what's going on. And yeah, the, the missing 401 stuff is uh, great. And, uh, you know, just randomly right now in my, in my head, it, the, the story of that child 
that was lost and uh, basically claimed a Bigfoot looked after him, I mm-hmm. recall. Do you, do you remember that story? It was like in North Carolina, I believe. It was in North Carolina, and I have heard many of those stories. That's crazy, I right? I have heard similar stories in the area where that happened. That happened in the Yankin, along the Yankin River area. Uh, there was another account, something very similar to that years before that. Ooh. But we have, I have heard very similar accounts, and I have had search and rescue people tell me very similar accounts as well, that when they come out, uh, these kids will tell me, big hairy man was taking care of me, and he kept me warm, and this, this, and that, and fed me, and and then he took me someplace to where I could be found at. Uh, it happens. Yeah, that's wild. That is certainly wild. There's there's so many stories like that that make you scratch your head. And for you know, for the longest time, I always thought you know Bigfoot. I don't I don't really believe. I was losing faith in Bigfoot, kind of like I lost faith entirely in uh, let's say uh, the Loch Ness monster. Um, I was kind of around the same um, same mindset. But then I'm hearing more and more of these encounters with Bigfoot, and then you hear the the thing with the child, and it sort of makes you think, well, maybe there's something more to it than um than what we know i i think we're going to get answers eventually i hope um i think with technology advancing the way it is quantum computing becoming more mainstream and when it does become more consumerized i I think people are going to be able to reach the unknown uh a little easier and not have to rely on science to do it because you know we can't rely on science to really give us the answers on this type of stuff because not necessarily they believe it they just don't want to believe it right. and um I, I i think the the citizen investigator even though we're a thorn in their asses we're we're the ones who are going to find the truth on much of this stuff i think that's right and uh, we definitely are coming to an end here. And I do appreciate your time with us all, Mr. Strickler. And again, sure. the, the website is phantomsandmonsters.com and, of course, cryptidhunters.org. And uh, obviously, my friend, I could talk to you for another hour. Very easy. And uh, we could discuss all kinds of other things here. I would love to get your take on. But I think this is a good point to sort of um, let you go here. And we can definitely continue a part two in this conversation. Uh, no problem. I, I hope you definitely would love to come back here and we could uh, do round two, my friend. Sure. Just let me know. Very nice. And uh, before I cut you loose, uh, I, I did want to ask you just a few more things in terms of uh, cryptids. Are there any re- reports out there of um, any of these cryptids uh, injuring someone? Very few. Very few. Okay. Very few. Uh, occasionally, something will pop up, but for the most part, it's usually secondhand information. Um, I think a lot of these people, if they do get injured, a lot of times won't even talk about it. No. Um, yeah. For whatever reason, but um, it it it's very few and far between. And very, I think we can feel okay. fortunate in that. Not yeah, that I want to necessarily yeah. <laughs> have an encounter with a a nine foot uh, upright canine, but uh, right. You know, they do seem to stand their ground, but they don't seem to be very aggressive. And uh, in terms of, I guess, um, when we're going back to skepticism, are there any cryptids that you just, or other things that you just simply don't believe in a- at all? Like, um, again, I-, I mentioned the Loch Ness Monster. I'm losing faith right. in believing in, in the Loch Ness Monster. Um, is there anything yeah, like have, that for you? I have my questions on that one particularly, though I do believe that there, there are some possibilities of uh, unidentified creatures in, in large lakes. Uh, I'm working on a I'm working on a case right now in, okay. in Maine in Moosehead Lake about something that was seen just last week, and we've got several photographs I've got up on the blog actually, Ooh. and okay. um, I I don't know we don't know what it is. It's a very smooth skinned creature. It almost looks like the the skin of a shark, but of course it's a landlocked lake, and um, we just don't know what it is. Very nice. Yeah, I'll I'll definitely go on the blog and uh, check that out. And that uh, we could probably talk a little bit more about that. Uh, and Lon, once again, I do want to wish you the very best, my friend. I hope you have a great uh, 2024. And it seems like the fireworks are just kicking off with everything going on in the world, Lon. I mean, I yeah, think we're, it's I think we're busy. yeah, we're going to be in for quite a ride. I think this year. I've been telling my folks on the team that I just expect 2024 to be busy. I hear and, you. And uh, yeah. it's only been a week and a half, and it's already been busy. Hell, Saturday we're going and doing an investigation for another sighting. So, oh my, yeah, we're gonna keep busy. 
Very nice. Lon, I'm going to have to bring you on here much, much sooner, my friend. I feel like we have so much ground to uh, cover here. Sounds good. Just let me know. Very nice, my friend. Once again, I do want to thank you tremendously for being a part of the program, my friend. Uh, plug anything you'd like. Um, if you want to, go ahead. Maybe the YouTube well, channel. I mean, I, yeah, the YouTube channel is uh, Phantoms of Monsters Radio. You just search Phantoms of Monsters Radio and it'll come up. Uh, we do a lot of uh, firsthand, first time, well, personal reports on there uh, as opposed to interviews. Uh, but it's um, it's cases, I've, many times cases I've been involved with are reports that I receive from just regular people who are looking for answers. Uh, I've written nine books. I have four books right now in, in print and in audio book. Uh, if you just go to Amazon and search Lon Strickler, they'll all come up. And uh, again, it's famsmonsters.com. It's a daily blog that I write uh, what's going on, what cases that and what reports are sent to me at that period of time. And then the FAMS Monsters 14 research team can be found on uh, cryptidhunters.org. And it's a blog where we put uh, much of our reports at. And we have other uh, other links there for maps and such to where, uh, just like the Chicago Mothman map and the uh, Pennsylvania Cryptid Canine map we have there of uh, reports that we've received over the years. Very nice, my friend. I will definitely talk to you on the other side. Take care. Stay safe. And there he goes, boys and girls. That was our guest, Mr. Lon Strickler. Definitely go check out his website and the blog. Go to michaeldeacon.com and sign up for that newsletter. And of course, the fun doesn't just stop there. Take us on the road. Just search the Michael Deacon program and you'll find us. And also, before we go out here tonight, I do want to welcome a very new sponsor to the program, The Vouch Store. I'll have the link up here in the bottom for you. And this is a new company that we have teamed up with. And this all started by uh, an email I received months and months ago. This uh, gentleman by the name of Kevin. But not everyone goes through with it, but this gentleman did. And that's vouch.store slash Michael Deacon Show. By going to that link, you make sure to support this program. And I know a lot of people sometimes want to buy different things. And uh, we're offering different things here on this website. Tooth Ink, by the way. Full size tooth brush. It penetrates between your teeth, leaving them cleaner and wider. Oh yeah. With over 4,000 soft double air, ultra-fine bristles, and an 8-degree curved head. That's what she said. Full-size toothbrush hugs the curves of your mouth, cleans with half the effort, and penetrates between your teeth, leaving them cleaner and wider. Very nice. $8. Get yourself a toothbrush. That's vouch.store slash Michael Deacon Show. Ah, yes. Very, very cool. I love that. Once again, boys and girls, it's been a honor and pleasure to be here, and I will return with a live show very, very soon. And with that said, the world is a mysterious place, and life itself is a mystery. Until next time, Mahalo.